Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Edge 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Here's your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to IBM Edge, everybody. This is theCUBE's fifth year covering IBM Edge. We were at the inaugural Edge five years ago at, in Orlando. Mark Linster is here, uh, and he's joined by Lenly Henserling. Mark is the Senior Vice President of Product Development, and Lenly is the Senior Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at EDB Enterprise Database. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Okay, who wants nice to start? To Enterprise Database. Tell us about the company and what you guys are all about. Well, the company's been around for um, a little over 10 years now, and uh, our job is really to give companies uh, the ability to use Postgres as the platform for the digital business. So think about this, Postgres is a great open source database, uh, great capabilities for transactional management of data, but also multi-model data, man uh, data management. So think about uh, standard SQL data, but think also about uh, document-oriented, think about key value pair, think about GIS. So a great capability um, that is very, very robust, has been around for quite a few years. Um, and is really ready to allow companies to, to build on them for, for the new digital business, but also to migrate off their existing commercial, or commercial databases that are too expensive. So what's the history of, of Postgres? Can you just sort of Postgres, educate me on that? Postgres, uh, so, so the same, same roots uh, back, in, back with System R, where DB2 came from, Oracle came from, so uh, uh, Berkeley, that's where, that's where the whole thing started out. Postgres is really the successor to Ingress, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then it turned into PostgreSQL and has been licensed yeah. under open source license, the PostgreSQL license, since 1996. And it's a very, very vibrant open source community that's been driving forward for many years now. And um, in our view is the best available uh, relational and multi-model database today. What's well, the mainspring of relational database management systems, essentially, yeah. is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So, and Lenly, uh, from a product standpoint, how do you productize that? You know, you got open source. Yeah, so, so, so open source really, you know, companies that have a distribution of open source for a database, an operating system, whatever, the, the open source company most people are acquainted with is uh, Red Hat and Linux, right? And so we do the same thing that they do, but for Postgres database. We take uh, the distribution, we add testing, we add some other uh, functionality around it so that you can run uh, Postgres responsibly, as Mark likes to say. So high availability capability, failover management, replication, uh, a backup solution, and instead of leaving it as an exercise for a, a customer who wants to use open source, we test all this together, and then we validate it, and we give them a complete package with documentation and, and services that they can access to help them you know, be successful with it. So if Michael Stonebreaker were sitting right here, say, Michael, what do you think about Postgres? He'd say, oh, I had to start Vertica because we needed a new way. Yet, sort of Postgres SQL you know, is sort of the killer, you know, remains the killer platform in the industry, doesn't it? Why is that? I mean, it's interesting when you talk to guys like Stonebreaker, it's sort of, it's dogma almost, but yet customers you know, talk with their wallet. Well, oh. and, and, and it is, I mean, he did a very, very nice job architecting it, right? It is a database that is extensible. The reason we had the first JSONB, or document-oriented implementation, um, in the relational database space is because it was designed to make it easy to add new capabilities, new data types, new indexes, et cetera, into the same transactional model. That's why we have JSONB, that's why we have uh, post-GIS, that's why we have key value pair. So it was really well architected. And when you think about who else, not just Vertica, has taken this engine, yeah. um, you know, it is in, uh, in the Teza, it is in a bunch of other uh, uh, platforms. Data, right? Green Plum. Green yeah. Plum, yeah. yes. So it's a really robust architecture, very, very nicely designed, and uh, it, just, it just does the job, and it does it really well, which is what you want a database to do, right? It's not that exciting but it's really stable, yeah. it really works, the data is still there tomorrow. Um, that's really what the requirements are. And, and to translate a little bit, you know, Mark mentioned um, you know, PostGIS, which is geospatial capability uh, for, for the Postgres database. 
And so we distribute that along with Postgres and, and you know, test it so that you know it works. Um, and he mentioned uh, HStore. So that's how you can actually store Internet of Things data really well into Postgres. And uh, you know, when we talk about SQL, no SQL databases, so they're document databases. And, and the ability to have personalization at the same level you can in a documented oriented database, but in a structured SQL database, are, are the kinds of things that have been added to Postgres over the years. And again, it's because of the basic architecture that Stonebreaker put in place as an object relational database. Mm. It's, it, it's so interesting to look at the history of database. And I you talk about Stonebreaker, he's been on a number of times. It's just fascinating to, to listen to one of the fathers of this industry. Um, but 10 years ago, database was like such a boring topic. And now it's exploded, right? I mean, and now you got Amazon, you know, going after Oracle, you know, Oracle, you know, fighting the good fight. Uh, so many NoSQL databases coming in, SQL becoming the killer big data app, if you will. Mm -hmm. Why all of a sudden the database so, gets so interesting? Yes, yeah, so, so you know, what happened was application models changed. Led by Facebook, led by Amazon, and Google, right? They said, let's refactor the applications and let's refactor the way we handle storage. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that led to the you know, rise of a polyglot of databases is what a lot of people are saying. So, you know, you, you have fit for purpose solutions and you may have three or four or five of them that, you know, in your overall architecture. One thing about Postgres is we're able to, because of the data type support that Mark mentioned, you know, fit into that well. We don't try and do everything. So if somebody says, I'm going to use Mongo for data capture, uh, or I'm going to use Cassandra to, you know, for capturing my Internet of Things data, we have what we call foreign data wrappers in the Postgres world. We call them just enterprise DB adapters. But you know, to Mongo, to Cassandra, you know, to Hadoop, and can do bi-directional uh, data there and, and just keep that data at rest over there in the other world, but be able to project a relational schema onto it. We can push our data into those. and we've, we've got a great use case we've, we've been talking about um, with a customer who had you know, over a petabyte of data. And in the past what you do is you go buy an expensive archiving solution and add that to it. Now you just use Hadoop uh, distributed file system, push the data off there as it ages, and have a foreign data wrapper uh, that allows you to still query that data when it's out of your basic operational data set and, and move forward. Can, so can I call that a connector? Or a is connector, that, yeah. yeah, that's right. not okay. a bad idea. And yeah. it's interesting because, I don't, you guys remember Hadapt, probably, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They came out yeah, there with absolutely. like the connector killer, mm -hmm. yes. and it failed. Yeah. Um, seems like connectors are just fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and one of the really interesting things is, is we call it data federation, right? With the, the philosophy here is, leave the data where it is. I mean, there is some data that should live in Hadoop or Cassandra, right? If I'm doing, an e-commerce site with transactions and click streams. Well, the click streams really should live in Hadoop. That's the natural place for them. The transactions should be in a transactional database. With a foreign data wrapper, I can run queries without moving the data that will allow me to say, well, before you bought the brown teddy bear, which pages did you look at? And yeah. I can do that in an integrated system, and I can do a, a fit for purpose architecture, and that's what we think is really exciting. And, and that's fundamental to this new sort of programming or application model that's that, right. that you were talking that's about, right. is move five megabytes of code to a petabyte of data, yeah. as opposed to moving data, which we know has gravity right. and speed right. of light issues and so right. forth. So, well thank you for that little brief education, appreciate it. So mm -hmm. let's get into your, your business now, your relationship with IBM, what customers are doing. You mentioned IoT data, so. So talk more about your, your business and your relationship with IBM and what you guys are doing for customers. Yeah, well there, there are a couple things. You know, we, we mentioned Oracle, right? And, and there's, you know, there, there are all the new databases and then there's your, I don't know, dare we say legacy, you know, proprietary databases as well. And, and people are looking to, you know, become more efficient in, in how they spend. So we've done an, another thing with Postgres. We've added Oracle compatibility in terms of data types. So we support all the data types that Oracle does. And we support PL SQL. They're sort of variant of stored procedure language. And have implemented a lot of the, the packages um, that they have as well. So we can migrate workloads from Oracle over into an open source based solution. 
and and you know give uh, a lot of uh, cost effectiveness there options to customers. So right? this is uh, this is a way that I can sort of have Oracle license database license and maintenance avoidance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> where possible. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, and where, where it makes sense. Where it well, makes yeah, sense. Obviously, my core. Yeah. I'm going to keep. But but let's face it. The number one cost component of a TCO analysis of an Oracle customer is the database license and maintenance cost. That's right. Yeah. It's not the people. That's the, one of the few examples I can think of where that's the case. <laughs> right, it's always the people cost. That's IT right. is very labor that's intensive, right. but yeah. for an Oracle customer, it's the database license, license, you know, because they license by core. Yep. Cores are going through the roof. It's right. been great for Oracle's business. Although, I mean, when you agree that Oracle, I think, sees the writing on the wall, that the SaaS is really the sort of new control point for mm -hmm. the industry and they're sort of you, know, you see the acquisition of NetSuite and com competition with Workday and, yep. and and the like, but the database remains the sort of heart of yeah, and, of their and, and really it's 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 movement to the cloud, both both private cloud and public cloud, and so we've been doing work there. We've had a, a public cloud database as a service solution on Amazon for what four years, four years, mm -hmm. four years, Mark, and and have gained a lot of experience with that. And we were running that, sort of running a retail, you know, you can license the database and we'll provision it there. And so what we've done recently is, is changed our perspective and said, let's put this into the hands of customers and let them stand up their own database as a service, but also do it in a way that they can choose what workload should go to Amazon and what workloads might go to their private cloud built on OpenStack. And, and be able to, to arbitrage that, if you will, because they, they now have a way to provision the databases and make a choice about where to put it. So that's a bring your own license model that you just talked bring about? Bring your own or license you're, model, or... Or you're a, in the marketplace, and... Uh, we're in the marketplace, you know, on Amazon, where, you know, we can supply it that way, but, but customers have shown a preference for bring your own license. They want to make the best enterprise deal they can with a, a vendor like us, or, or whomever else, you know, and then, <laughs> And then have control over it. Well, so I mean, Amazon obviously wants you to be in the marketplace, but I talked to—I won't even mention—but but I talked to you know some some CEOs of, of of database companies, and they say, you know, we're in the marketplace, but yeah, we get on the marketplace. Next thing you know, Amazon's pushing them toward DynamoDB, That's or right. you know, and That's you right. know, and they, now Amazon's come out with Aurora and the Oracle migration, and you mm -hmm. know, the intent to to go after that business. So. Yeah, Amazon's moving up the stack, and you got to be they, careful. They are, they are. But you know, you know, the the thing about Amazon is that they're a pure play in the cloud company. Yeah. Okay, and all of the data shows that it's like a mix. You know, it's going to be a hybrid cloud. You know, half the companies <laughs> not Angie Jassy's data. Eighty percent, eighty percent of the the people in the cloud are going to be, you know, on prem still continuing their journey through virtualization, <laughs> right? Yeah. Let, well, alone, right. let alone going to the cloud. But, but you know, we, we want to be something that lets them put what they want in the public cloud and lets them manage on the private cloud in the same manner so that they can provision databases with a few clicks, just like they do on Amazon, but do it in their data center. And are you, are you, are you doing that on, with SoftLayer as well, or, or not yet, or? Not yet. Not yet. We, so we, we've, built, we've built this provisioning capability ourselves, you know, and mm -hmm. it came out of the work we did putting up databases on Amazon. So what are you guys doing here at Edge? Edge kind of infrastructure show, I mean, well, databases yeah, infrastructure. It's, power, it's, it's worth talking about our work with Power. The power power is, a, is, a, is a big partner for us. I mean, par, Power is, I think, very, very interesting for database customers um, because of uh, the, 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 the much higher clock speeds and the capabilities that the Power processor has, right? When I'm looking at Power, I get more oomph out of a single core which really for a database customer is very, very interesting, right? Because all databases are licensed by core. Right. So it's a much better deal for the customer. And uh, specifically for Postgres, Postgres scales very well with higher clock speeds. So by having, um, let's say, uh, by growing performance, not by adding more cores, but by making this individual cores faster, that plays very, very well to, to the Postgres uh, uh, capabilities. Okay, so you are a, a power partner, one of the, part of that ecosystem that IBM's appealing to mm -hmm. to grow the, the, the open power base. Mm -hmm. And um, what kind of workloads are you, are you seeing your customers demand? And where are you having success? Um, Across, across the board, I mean, database is mostly, you know, infrastructure capability, so there's a lot of interest that we're seeing that, uh, you know, for all kinds of applications, really. What's the typical power customer look like these days? You got, 
You got some Oracle, you got some DB2, you guys are running on there. What's the mix kind of? I, 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 yeah, I, I think that the, the typical power co uh, customer is the typical enterprise uh, company, you know, and, and <laughs> what they're. A little bit and, of everything. A little bit of yeah. everything, but, but you know, one of the key things is that people are also looking at what they've got and the skills they have in place. You were talking mm -hmm. about people costs, right? Yeah. And, and their understanding of management their understanding of, of how to uh, you know, manage the relationship with the vendor even, and then saying, look, how can I move into the new world of digital transformation and start you know, my own private cloud options and things like that in, in an efficient way that makes efficient use of hardware I have in place and has a growth curve in new hardware that's coming out that fits my workloads mm -hmm. and you know in the profiles that Mark yeah. was talking about. Yeah, and and also the the resources, right? Which is very interesting when we when we look at these new digital applications with Postgres, because you can do so much in Postgres from geographic information systems to document oriented to key value, right? But you can do that with your existing developers, your existing DBAs. They don't need to go to school to learn a new database, right? And and that's mm -hmm. also a very very interesting uh, capability. So you can use your existing team uh, to do new stuff. Yep. What's happening in IoT? What, what problems are you solving there? And where's well, the demand? Um, sensor data collection, yeah. right? Really interesting because um, uh, sensor data tends to come in all different forms, right? I mean, we have a customer who collects uh, uh, temperature sensor, uh, temperature data, and, but the sensors are all you know, sending different data packets. So because we can do uh, document oriented or key value, we can easily easily accommodate that, right? In the old days with the relational model, I had to do all kinds of uh, tricks to sort of stuff all that into a, a relational table. My table would be almost empty at the end because I'd have to add columns for every vendor, et cetera. Here, now I can just put all that into the same format and um, you know, provided for analysis. So that's a really interesting capability. And, and it's interesting too, because you know, we've got really strong geospatial data support. And the intersection of that with IoT is a big deal. I mean, it, you know, they track your iPhone, they know where we are, they know what's going on, that's, that's sensor data. They know which lights in which building, which, you know, louvers that are controlling HVAC are, are malfunctioning or not. They want to know specifically where it is, not just what the sensor is. And some of that stuff moves around, right? And it gets replaced in a new place in the building and such. So, so we're well set up to handle those types of workloads. It was interesting when IBM bought the weather company. Yeah. And they, <laughs> you, know, you thought, okay, great, they're getting all these data scientists and weather data, that's cool, they can monetize that, but it's, it's an IoT play, isn't right. it? Because right. they talk about you know, sensors. I mean, it's got... reference data, it's reference data for other company specific IoT plays to have a broader set of sensors out there in their region and to understand what's happening with weather and, and things and then play that against what their experience is in managing their buildings, their manufacturing processes, everything. So what's the engagement model? I'm a customer, I want to do business with you. How do I do it, how do I engage? Well, I mean, uh, a lot of our business is direct with us, right, or others through, through partners um, and, and a lot of customers come to us because they want to get off legacy systems. But really what they do is once they understand the database and the capabilities, they say, okay, yeah, you can do the Oracle stuff, right? But what I'm really going to do with you is my new things because that's really exciting and it helps me um, kind of put a lid on the commercial license growth, right? So yeah, maybe I'm not going to get off it, but I will stop growing it. So I will start doing my new stuff on, uh, on Postgres. Uh, whenever I modernize something, Postgres is my going to be my database of choice. If I already open up uh, an application with its whole stack, right? This is this is one of the changes I'm going to make. And then the database as a service is, uh, right. is is very very interesting. So these four entry vectors. And then what happens is um, quite a few customers, after a short time, when they started with projects or applications, they end up making Postgres one of their database standards. Not the only one, right? But they make it one of the database standards so it gets into the catalog and every new project then has to consider, has to consider Postgres. And it's, it's interesting, there's a space created as Microsoft sort of put all their wood behind the air of becoming a competitor to high-end Oracle. And with this last release, they've probably gotten there, you know, arguably. But they've also raised their prices too. Right, and, and they've made the, the solution more complex. 
And so there's this space that was vacated for like a ton of workloads. And Postgres fits in there just about perfectly. Yeah. And we see you know, enterprise after enterprise come to us with, with a sheet that says, you know, we're going to get some of this NoSQL stuff. We're going to keep Oracle or DB2 over here for these really high-end things. You know, run my financials, run my sales order uh, processing, my manufacturing. And then we got this space in here. We got a slot for a relational database, and we want to go open source because of the cost savings, because of other factors, you know, its, its ability to grow and not be bound to, hey, what if the vendor decides they're going to go for a newer, cooler thing and make me upgrade, right. and, and I want to stay there and know that there's still being an investment made, and so there's a vibrant community around it, and, and it just fits that slot perfectly. Yeah, you got to pay for that digital transformation and all these IoT initiatives, you can't just keep Somehow. pouring it down to database right. licenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 exactly. All right, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much right. for coming on theCUBE, and Thanks appreciate so the, uh, yeah. the time. You're welcome. Enjoyed it. Thanks. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from IBM Edge 2016. Right back. Oh, hey.